I'm Ben Welly. I'm uh, with the World Resources Institute and its Ross Center for Sustainable Cities. I'm the director of uh, Integrated Transport and Innovation. We work globally on sustainable mobility um, through a network of international offices in Brazil, Mexico, India, um, a regional office in Africa, Turkey, um, and uh, as well as outside of those offices uh, globally. Well, um, thank you for the question about the impacts, uh, benefits, challenges posed by ride hailing um, in cities across the globe. You know, it's 2020 this year. And if you look back 10 years ago, this is about when the first Uber app launched, which was a service for what we call black cars, the luxury sedans that people could then call with um, either through app or SMS. And that's grown exponentially in the last 10 years. Um, around 2014 is when these things started to really take off. Um, and you started to see um, over the next few years, for example, in New York City, the um, trips through ride hailing apps overtake the trips through the um, you know, ubiquitous yellow taxi that everybody knows in movies and whatnot. So uh, our, our urban transport is really changing through ride hailing. It's hard to tell what the actual, um, you know, challenges and opportunities are at this point, but we're starting to get a glimpse of that. Cities are, so, some cities are seeing more congestion. Some have uh, attributed that to ride hailing and the increase in, in the vehicle kilometers traveled uh, due to people taking ride hailing. Some of these people, however, might be coming from um, um, trips that they otherwise would have made with a private car in some cities too. So, so we don't really know exactly what's happening. We do have some indications, however, in research in the US, for example, that, that's showing uh, a link between the increase in ride hail trips and a decrease in public transport trips. Um, and this is cause for concern because public transport is really the backbone of um, transport for access accessible cities for, for everyone um, and, and not a privileged um, transport system only for a few. Um, but we don't really know what's happening with ride hailing in a lot of the cities that we work in, in the, in the more low and middle income countries. So what we did was undertook a survey in four cities, Mumbai, uh, Mexico City, Beijing, and Sao Paulo, Brazil, to look at some behaviors of what's happening. And um, what we're finding is, and I'm only sharing some preliminary results, is a mixed bag. Um, for example, in Mexico City, about uh, over a fifth of trips from ride hailing, people say they otherwise would have took those by walking. So it's not something that's hurting public transport per se, a little bit are coming from public transport, but a larger percent are coming from walking trips. So there you have a sustainable mobility mode that um, is being you know, reduced because of ride hailing. But that being said, these might have been very long walking trips. So ride hail may be providing some more accessibility to, to um, commuters in that way. Um, another thing we found, for example, from Sao Paulo was that around a fifth of trips would not have happened had they not occurred through the ride hill uh, trip. And this also begs the question of, are these trips increasing accessibility? Are they just merely increasing vehicle kilometers traveled for uh, the sake of it, thus you know, increasing emissions and other uh, things such as uh, fat road fatalities? Um, you know, when you have this increase in vehicle travel, you get all these other um, externalities like increased emissions, air pollution, increased road fatalities from the overall exposure increase uh, in traffic. So we're seeing sort of a mixed bag, but, uh, you know, by and large, um, you know, th these trips are coming from somewhere. A lot of them are coming from um, sustainable mobility modes like public transport and um, walking. But it's not just public transport. GIZ has added to this group of surveys by um, uh, doing uh, a similar survey 
uh, to, to work with us in Nairobi. And in Nairobi, there's very poor preliminary results, but that shows um, that a very large percentage, I can't remember the exact number, but it's, it's around 40%, I think, of the ride hail trips are people who would have taken what we call the matatus. Those are the, the minibus taxis that make up almost the entirety of the public transport system in the country. So w ride hailing is not just a phenomenon of, of the global north, of Berlin, of New York City, of Washington, D.C., or um, um, you know London. These are things that are providing a lot of trips. There's, there's um, st um, country-level startups that are, uh, for example, DD is one of the largest ride hill companies in the world based in China. It's a global company. Um, it acquired, for example, the, the largest ride hill in, company in Brazil called 99. Um, you have Ola in India, which, you know, these, these services are providing a, 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 a huge amount of, of trips um, to people in, in cities in the developing world. So I think when we look at the policy landscape of how to address ride hailing, there's sort of um, a spectrum to consider. On one end, we have to consider the overall um, transport and mobility policies of the city. And on the other end, there's maybe more of the specific policies that will address the regulation of ride hailing itself. For example, the the driver requirements, the uh, labor standards that may take place. But getting back to that other end of the spectrum, which is more of the, the, ma the master planning or the transport policy level, um, as I was uh, uh, indicating earlier, we have people coming from other modes of transport, such as public transport or um, walking, or even their own private vehicle. But when we're trying to minimize the negative externalities or the negative outcomes that ride hailing, ride hailing might be causing, uh, we need to provide a mobility system that addresses the needs of people. And this means investing in high quality public transport. Um, people have to have accessibility to their opportunities, to jobs, to education, to services within a reasonable amount of time through the public transport system. Ride hailing might actually be a solution where there might be areas that are underserved, where um, new, um, the evolutions of what we call mobility as a service, there could be ways we capture ride hailing to actually input positively into public transport. But cities need to invest in and uh, maintain high quality public transport networks. They also need to provide and invest in other forms of new mobility like bicycle sharing and bicycle infrastructure, um, walking accessibility to transit, these last mile, first mile um, connectivity issues that can feed people into public transport that allows them not to use um, a private car. So um, these, these are things that are really important, probably as a, a high level aspect of how to regulate ride hailing. Um, I think there's also the new um, a newer emphasis on what we call demand side measures. So these are things like congestion charging, um, where you would cordon off a, an area of a city and charge vehicles to enter. Often this is sort of the city center or a, a wider area of the city center. Uh, London has had a congestion charge for some time, although um, I believe it exempts or has exempted in the past for higher vehicles. Um, which maybe would want to look to tweak that because uh, you would have then the four higher vehicles paying the congestion fee as well. In New York City, they just enacted a congestion charge um, for much of um, Man lower and midtown Manhattan. To enter that part, you will need to pay a fee. And I think this really goes beyond just, say, some cities approach where they're putting a tax on ride hail. So if I get a, a Uber trip or a, an Ola trip in, in India or a DD trip in Brazil, that the fee will be placed on my trip that will be paid either by the, the service provider or directly by me. Um, and you know, while this is also a form of a sort of taxing the, the negative externalities of, of, of consumption in this case, 
um, it may not in capture the broader approach that might be needed with, with congestion charging. But these are, these are things that are happening and, and are, can be very helpful as well. I'm not saying that a, uh, a ride hailing tax is, is a bad thing. It is one tool in the toolbox, as we say. And then on the other end, you have more of these technical um, uh, regulations that might ensure that uh, drivers are, are working fair hours, that there are security checks in place for drivers, that there are certain licensing uh, requirements or at least basic standards that the companies have to adhere to um, for, for drivers and uh, you know, requiring people to, to pick up people in certain areas, um, incorporating gender considerations uh, of women's security and, and so forth into, into regulations. So I, when I looked at best practices for ride hailing regulation and policy, I guess I would look at first the issue of congestion charging and public transport investment. Um, if you look at a city, say, like Vienna, which has done uh, an extraordinary job of investing in um, putting in practice high-quality public transport in recent years. Um, another example is Seattle, Washington in the United States, which, unlike other cities in the U.S., has not seen a drop in public transport ridership. They've seen an increase. So these are things that are part and parcel of, say, specific ride hill regulation, but investment into public transport that can keep those options um, strong. Additionally, you have places like New York City that um, have instituted a congestion charge. Um, it actually was made possible by the, the state legislature um, in conjunction with the city, but a lot of this was driven by the increase in congestion that's being caused by um, the ride hailing trips. So that's, I think, a, a best practice and the right direction is looking at those congestion charging and other demand side um, policies. Um, on the more uh, specific regulations to ride hailing, Sao Paulo, Brazil is a good example, uh, where they have created a, a law that um, is, um, and, and I'm not um, intimate with the exact details of everything of, of the, the law, but for example, the, the charges that are assessed by the city on the ride hail trips, the tax, per, if you want to call it that, are based on a vehicle kilometers traveled basis. They also incentivize um, um, through, a, through a lower tax um, or a lower fee um, on pooled rides. So if you're sharing your ride hail trip, that the cost, the fee placed on that by the city is going to be less. They also have incentives built into the law to um, uh, encourage women drivers to encourage access to transport, uh, mass transit and, and other types of incentives that try to bring in uh, these other sustainable forms of mobility. So that's one place that I would look to of, of a ride hailing regulation that seems to be uh, shaped with um, some decent good intentions. Thank you for having me.